All right, we are inside the Supra today. Uh, and I've made a couple of uh, un-modifications as well as gotten some new OEM stuff that uh, the car was missing when I first got it. <clears throat> the... craziest thing that I was able to find um, and I'm surprised that I was able to find this was a set of manuals including the supplements <clears throat> and the uh, roadside assistance uh, documentation from a 1998 Toyota Supra um, that originally came from Santa Cruz so in California um, I actually found I so I it took me like a month to track this thing down, basically of just searching uh, every night for a few minutes. And what ended up happening was um, it wasn't on eBay and it wasn't on Amazon. There are plenty of other models on those sites or uh, plenty of other manuals for those model years, for other model years on those sites. But um, I ended up just doing a Google search one day and... Uh, a company called Books for Cars, like books and then the number four and then cars, popped up and they had this for sale for 150 So I just immediately bought it, um, you know, without even thinking twice. Uh, that, that seemed to be a crazy good deal for something that basically just doesn't exist <laughs> on the internet. Um, yeah, it took them a while. They said that they had to um, sh uh, source it. So I'm thinking they had some kind of uh source that had some somewhere else in the country that had a bunch of manuals and you know it took them about two weeks to get it shipped to my door but um it came it's the real deal and uh you know this is uh basically the only oem thing that's totally missing uh that has now been replaced so <clears throat> i'm super happy um if you have a somewhat rare car i would recommend giving them a call um they are a small bookshop in Seattle, or actually, no, sorry, Portland, I believe. Either Portland or Seattle, I don't remember. But they're in the Pacific Northwest, and they specialize in uh, documentation and literature for old, um, old and specialty and import cars and stuff like that. Aftermarket imported cars, so super happy about that. Um, it's like when you get a watch and it has the box and papers. Um, you know, technically this isn't the, uh, original manual, but, I mean, it's a manual, so, th they are all the same. Um, I'm gonna be on the lookout for some additional, like, sales, marketing collateral for the Supra. I might just, uh, like, just hang out on eBay for, uh, for that stuff, but other than that, um, yeah, this, this car is complete. It's now registered. Uh, I got my plates, so this car is now a full drivable Toyota Supra. Uh, and the next, and I think in the next video, I'll uh, I'll take it out for a spin. I've I've already driven it um, once just to uh, you know just to shake it down and hook up the laptop to the ECU and check out all the boost and slip uh, settings and all that stuff, but. Um, yeah, super happy about that. Uh, another thing I did was I bought a specialty USB cable for the AM Infinity. And, uh, I, I don't want to pull the carpet up now, but, um, basically the AM Infinity uses a IP67, which is intrusion protection, i.e. waterproof USB connector, which is like a twist lock. And instead of threads, it has uh, two tabs, 180 degrees apart from each other on the on the plug that you pl uh, that you hold in your hand and then plug into the ECU, which is actually the female. It's the male USB, but the female uh, uh, connector plug. So um, I'll put the part number down in the description. Uh, AM, it's. Like, the part that they use is, like, 50 bucks or something, and it's out of stock everywhere, so I went on a little treasure hunt um, to find out exactly what part they use, and that uh, is screwed into the ECU now, so that 
USB cable will always be there, um, so I can just put the lap, you know, put the laptop or connect the laptop uh, quickly without dealing with a USB, uh, like a regular USB cable that will just break off if you kick it or like the carpet gets in the way or, or whatever. And it's, you know, semi-permanent, so I can just leave that cable there and keep it under the floor mat and it's good to go. Uh, the next big thing that was done are the speaker grills and the speaker mounts. Um, I took some pictures of the door um, with the door card off, and it's uh, it's pretty it's it was pretty crappy. It was pretty shitty. Um, number one, they had they had screwed the um, the actual speakers into the door cards, like this like this vinyl <laughs> stuff, cardboard and vinyl or particle board or whatever it is. Um, so. Basically, the speakers were just flapping around, and they it didn't sound terrible. Like, they didn't make noise, uh, like flapping noises, but it just didn't sound good. And so what I did was I took the door cards off. There's a ton of videos on YouTube on how to do that. It's, it's basically just a bunch of screws. There's no, like, weird clips or anything like that that, that might break. It's, it's literally just screws. Um, I think there's about seven screws, and then... Um, oh, actually, there are two clips on the back of the door, uh, on the on the rearward facing edge of the door. But other than that, it's pretty easy. And then getting the top off, like it hangs from the top, the belt line there. So that was a little bit um, took a little finessing, but otherwise it comes off in one piece and goes on back together real easy. But anyways, this, what they had done was they uh, took these speakers, which are Alpine Type S's, um, which are kind of like you know like a decent entry level speaker. And they took the grill, the, like the surround and the grill, and just like screwed it into the vinyl and then sandwiched the vinyl and then mounted the speakers to that. So it was just terrible. Um, I have a picture and I'll, I'll put it into the video. But So I, I cleaned all that up. Um, unfortunately, the tweeters, that, uh, the, the, that mounting location for the tweeters is not stock. You can see that the stock tweeter goes up there, but that's a real pain in the ass to get to, so they just left those there, which is fine. But the, the tweeters that they put in, instead of getting a, com you know, a coaxial system, they put these separate tweeters in, and they drilled... They First of all, they drilled holes into the door cards, which sucks, because that's just modifying an OEM part that's out of production now. But... Worse than that, they cut out a section of the door, like a, you know, not a huge section, like a three by five inch. It's like the size of an index card. They cut out the, the steel in the door and, uh, yeah, they just cut it out so that the tweeters would fit back there. So I need to, I need to get that fixed somehow. I don't know. I, I certainly can't weld, um, in here in the garage. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that. It's not structural. Um, and it's a small enough piece that it's not really a big deal, but I mean, it just bugs me. So eventually I will get those fixed. Um, yeah, same, same on the other side. What I did was, uh, I installed some, uh, some hard, uh, adapter plates that I found on eBay. I think they were like 50 bucks or something. Um, they go where the stock speaker box would have gone. And, of course, those were missing the bolts that came in. So I replaced it all with stainless hardware. And then remounted the speakers directly to the um, to the adapter plates with stainless hardware. And then I mounted, I, I remounted the grill only to the, to the door cards. So now it's a proper speaker setup where the, the speaker driver is bolted to the door or, you know, bolted to something that's bolted to the door. And the grill is on the on the door card, so it's not just floating in space, flapping around like like it was. And it does sound better. Um, it, there's a, there's a lot more mid range <laughs> because it actually has something to vibrate against. Um, so yeah, very happy with that. Uh, this tweeter is still busted. I need to find a replacement. Um, it doesn't move anymore. I had to basically super glue it in place, which is fine. Um, that's just on the backside. So it's uh, glued in place. Um, I'm going to replace both. Luckily, those are super cheap. Um, you know, I think you can get a good pair for way less than 100 bucks. So I'll probably just get some new Alpines.
uh, and just replace those. Um, I like these drivers, they sound pretty good. Um, and the rear, the rear speakers uh, were fine. Th those are also just, uh, I think they're also Alpines and they're behind those grills and they didn't fuck with the grills, so they look fine. I don't think I'll be changing those. Uh, next thing I need to do is get my Sony CarPlay head unit installed. This old Kenwood is, it works fine. Um, but it's, you know, it doesn't do, uh, CarPlay and it's just got a really dated interface and the touchscreen is like that old style that isn't very sensitive. So you have to kind of like stab at the screen, which is just annoying and kind of dangerous. Um, although this one does have a volume knob, so, um, yeah, I've got the CarPlay unit, so I'll just need a, a long weekend or something to, to put it in and do the wiring and deal with whatever wiring nightmares back there, which I'm sure is going to be real fun. Um, okay. The other mod was this BTI gauge. I ripped out the, uh, the broken boost gauge, which was sitting in the 52 millimeter spot right here. I put a, I put a, uh, a video clock in there temporarily for a little bit. Um, and then finally this thing showed up. Uh, this 4.3 BTI, which is awesome. Very, very cool. Uh, in fact, let me start up the car. Okay, so... Very cool. So it's got a bunch of screens. This is the main screen. Um, when I'm driving around, I'll uh, get some shots of it. But yeah, there's a bunch of functionality here. Like you can choose different screens and a bunch of uh, CAN information. It sits on the CAN bus and connects directly to the uh, ECU. So basically what I did was um, there's a mounting bracket that you install onto the back of the dash. And then this inserts into the hole where the clock was and interfaces with the mounting bracket. And then there's a wire, a two wire, excuse me, a four wire uh, power and can that um, goes down to the ECU through the dash. It's real easy. I just put a flashlight in there and found a path and connected it and that was it. It works. I've also got a, a TPMS sensor that I just received that uh, plugs into the back of this thing. So as soon as this thing is in the shop, I'm gonna have the tire, uh, the tire shop uh, install the TPMS sensors and get all that working. So, um, yeah, one of the nice things on newer cars is they basically all have TPMS sensors. Regular cars have low light or uh, low pressure warnings, but the sports cars all have um, actual PSI readings. So that'll be nice to have in an old car like this. Uh, and of course, the the biggest thing is I put the OEM steering wheel back in this thing, which makes it look way way better um yeah i ripped out the nardi deep corn wheel and the nardi hub sorry it's kind of dusty in here there's dust flying everywhere um i ripped out the nardi wheel and the hub which was uh kind of a challenge but uh, eventually i got it um so the way that the nardi hub and wheel works is there's six allen number three allen bolts on the face of the wheel. It's just a metal plate. Um, and what you do is you just, you remove the Allen bolts and then the horn is a slip fit. The horn button is like right in the middle and it's a slip fit uh, into the into the space that um, the hub nut sits. And the way it works is, I'll put a picture up, but the way it works is the horn actually grounds into the wheel itself. And then there's a uh, 12 volt coming from the OEM harness to the horn. And then when you push the horn, it actually connects the circuit uh, from the horn signal or the horn power to the ground of the actual like steering column. There's no, it doesn't use the ground that uh, comes out of the harness connector. So that tripped me up a little bit, um, but Basically, you have to install the horn for it to work because it contacts the inside of the wheel, which contacts the steering column, which is connected to ground. Um, one thing that the Nardi hub 
one thing that's different than the OEM wheel is the OEM wheel comes off pretty easy. There's a, I believe a 19 millimeter nut in there. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's not very tight. It's, you know, it's, I don't know, 20, like 30 or 40 foot pounds, something like that. So I just undid that. And I thought that the Nardi hub would come off easily, but it did not. And, you know, I like kind of hit it like this, you know, a bunch of times and it wasn't budging. I pulled on it, didn't budge, and I didn't really want to push my luck. So what I did was I went to Harbor Freight and got a wheel puller kit. And what that is, is a plate with some holes in it and a big hole in the middle, a threaded hole in the middle. And then there's a giant, uh, they call it a pressure bolt. So the pressure bolt goes in and then there's a, there's an extension on the front of the pressure bolt, which is like a cone, and that slips into the top of the steering column. So it centers it. And then what you do is you thread that through the plate. And then there's addition, there's the six holes where the Allen bolts were, right? And what you do is you take something with an equal thread pitch and then thread it into those holes. I had some studs laying around that had the exact same thread pitch. The kit doesn't come with anything that works, so beware you'll have to you know use your own use your own bolts to uh to pull the, the thing out but um what happened was uh they wouldn't fit on the holes in the plate so i basically just had to find some brackets with small enough holes and then put those on top of the uh on top of the puller plate and then what you do is just tighten it all up and then start torquing the pressure bolt down like tidy righty tighty and then what it does is it it wants to go in so as it's going in towards the column the plate comes up and since the plate is attached to the wheel which is attached to the hub the entire thing just pops off and it was loud like i had to give it probably uh probably 80 or 90 foot pounds of torque like i was wrenching on it um and then it went boom and just came off and then the whole thing just slipped off uh, and then, you know, once that's done, you just disconnect the horn harness and that was it. The previous owner, thank God, still had the clock spring, the airbag clock spring installed. So what I did was, unfortunately, this is a recalled airbag, so I didn't hook this up. Um, this is disconnected right now. But what you would do is, you you know, disconnect the battery and all that, be safe, etc. And then you... Um, Put the wheel on remember make sure to mark everything too with a with a sharpie so that you know what 12 o'clock is put the wheel on put the washer and the nut on you know you tighten the wheel and then the wheel installs minus this airbag module in the middle and then what you do is you take the clock spring route it wire route it through the wheel install the there's like a middle airbag here i should have it on the car there's a middle airbag harness and then this end here actually connects to the airbag itself. So right now this is disconnected. It's not even installed. And I put a bunch of electrical tape over the airbag, the airbag itself, the connector on the airbag itself. So there's no like static electricity or whatever that, you know, I, I don't know. There, people say all sorts of shit on the internet, but just to be safe, I put that there and then... I'm going to call Toyota and get an airbag replacement at some point in the new year, probably in January, uh, since everything's, you know, either backed up or closed right now because it's the holidays. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's, uh, you know, pretty much an OEM interior now, minus the BTI gauge, which has all the functionality of like 10 of those gauge pod things, which, you know, I had in my old car, but these days, this is just so much nicer, especially when I get the TPMS and all that good stuff. Um, it's a really nice unit. Works great. Makes me want to buy more sensors <laughs> so I can populate more information into it. Um, as far as the rest of the car goes, I mean, I got, again, I got the all the uh, dome light stuff working. The sensors back in. Um, I put LEDs on the dome lights and the other interior lights, like in the trunk. Um, airbags are going to be done by Toyota, or this airbag. That one's installed, but I also disconnected that one um, for now, until the other one gets in. I've got the manuals. Steering wheel is in. Speakers are fixed. 
new head units going in, but this one works. I mean, this one works fine with Bluetooth. And I think the only th the only real thing I want to do in here is I have to fix this this thing. It doesn't the lock the auto lock works fine, and like the car alarm lock works fine, but this just doesn't do anything. So the cable itself is moving. Like when I had the door card off, I could see the cable moving when I when I did this. So it must be something in the actual lock mechanism. Um, but that's going to require some additional work. I don't know if I'm even, even going to bother because I don't use that thing since the auto lock works fine. Um, other than that, I think I just want to get new gauges uh, or at least refresh the ones that I have now. I really, really like the stock gauges. That's one of my favorite things about this car. It's got the tack in the middle, like on the Porsche. And... The only thing that's wrong with this one is the needles are faded a little bit and the uh, the tack is a little jumpy at low RPM. Like when you're driving and getting it up in the rev range, it seems to be stable, but like at idle, it's it's not like a it's not like a like how it behaves when it's hunting for idle. It's actually just like shaking, which is just I think it's just an old spring or resistor or whatever. I, I don't know how it works, but you know, they have LED retrofit kits and like TRD 10,000 RPM tags. I don't really need any of that. Um, this car is not going to go to like 9,000 RPM ever. So I think what I'll do is I'll just look for a refresh kit or maybe just buy a new, uh, new cluster module. Um, and then maybe the, uh, the AC LED controls, control LEDs for the controls. That might be, that might be worth it. Um, so yeah, this thing is uh, almost done as far as interior goes. I'm I'm pretty happy with the progress so far. I mean, finding that that manual was a huge stroke of luck. So just right place, right time. But I was searching every single day for a month. So eventually, I found one. And yeah, I'll give that company books for cars, uh, books number four cars dot com uh, a call. See if they have what you need. Um, yeah, next video will be me driving this thing with the new wheel, which is an actual normal size steering wheel, which is what I like and what I'm used to. So I'm pretty excited for that. Okay, see ya. Thanks, bye.